If you'd open your Bible, the first Kings chapter number eight, um, we're going to, I believe this is what the Lord would have me to preach to you today. And uh, that's always a nice thing. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk about promises today. And uh, first Kings chapter number eight, and, and uh, we hope you get a blessing. Uh, we're going to talk about promises and it's uh, very evident that I don't know how, where you're at. Uh, if I was just to be frank with you, I think in my life, uh, I, there are some things that cause me stress. There are some things that cause me anxiety. And uh, really, and it's unfortunate, I can remember a time when I didn't have a cell phone. And, and I, honestly, uh, I was living a Christian life and didn't know what was going on in our government. <laughs> and I had less anxiety and I had less to think about. Now, don't get over spiritual with me and say we're supposed to pray for leaders and all this, that, and the other. That's just my synopsis, okay? Um, the, the, the tenor in which we live today would, uh, you know, cause a snail to crawl black into his shell. Let me, t let me just say you this. If you watch that presidential, uh, presidential debate, um, the... Uh, the, the uh, the, let's see, the female that was up there talking, in my opinion, was a great picture of how the Antichrist will come onto the scene. The Bible says about the Antichrist that he is going to be able to speak well, he's going to have wisdom, he's going to be sharper than sharp, and the Bible says about him, the whole world shall wander after him. And that was one thing that I got out of that debate. And I'm not talking this, this, this person or that person, I'm just saying you've got to watch it. Because the Bible says that even the very elect would be deceived that they're going to follow that person. Okay? But, and so I say all that on the coattails of this uh, promises. Not only that, if we're to speak spiritually, we understand historically to give you a fact that if you are light, Christians are light. In 6,000 years of history, the, the God of this world has always tried to stomp uh, light out. Darkness has always tried to put the lights out. You say, prove it. Uh, what about Jesus Christ? He said, I'm the light of the world. What did the world do with the Son of God as he was light? They tried to put his lights out. Amen. Hey, for the last 2,000 years, you cannot argue with me. You cannot argue with history. It would uh, stand up in any court of law. Christians have been persecuted for the last 2,000 years. Why? Because you represent eternal light. So the battles that you're going through, uh, they may be emotional battles, but they're also spiritual battles if you're trying to walk in the light as he is in the light and you have fellowship one with another. And in so doing, I'm reminding it, if I said it the other night, the only way for electricity to flow through those wires, when electricity flows through wires, when the Spirit of God is flowing through your life, electricity flows through wires, those electrons and protons and neutrons are all banging off of one another. If the lights are on and the electricity is flowing, you know what it creates? Resistance. Heat. <laughs> and the Lord said, I were that you either, if the lights are on, you're going to be hot, but it's going to draw some resistance. And that resistance is, is in the type of, uh, it is in the type of uh, anxiety. It's in the type of distress. It's in the type of fear. Let me have you look back over your last week and ask you, have you been stressed? Have you felt some anxieties? Have you felt some fears? Okay? And so that's what, that's, you say, well, where's this message come from? This message just comes right from my life. So what do I want to do? I want to be a help to another person. I want to try to uh, find some things that on a, a daily basis, when I'm alone, because usually that's when the anxieties come, to be honest with you. When I'm alone, that's when the fears come. When I'm alone, uh, that's when the anxieties come. When I'm alone, I start to get crushed and all this, that, and the other. And, um, and th these are some things that I found that, that help and, and things of that nature. So we'll talk about promises today. And uh, so if you would, look at 1 Kings chapter uh, 8. And, um, and I'm in Isaiah. Uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. And um, we'll look at verse uh, 22. Here Solomon is putting forth a prayer 
before, he, uh, before the dedication of the temple. And uh, 1 Kings chapter number 8, this is what Solomon says. Uh, Solomon says, uh, and verse 22, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee. That's always a good thing to do in your life is just to glorify the Lord like that. Because there is no other God besides Jehovah God. There is no other God besides the Lord Jesus Christ and the list of names that he has. But that's a good thing to do. Uh, there's no other God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with, his servants, with thy servants uh, that walk before thee with all their heart who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, promises, thou promised him. Thou spakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, there shall not fail thee a man uh, in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel so that thy children take heed to their way that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. So you see uh, in, in both those verses there, I believe it's verse number 24 and verse number 25, Solomon in the, in the presence of all Israel before the dedication of this temple where God would meet with them and tabernacle with them, Solomon finds in his heart of hearts, he reverts back to God's promises. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for being good to us, God. We are blessed beyond measure. And Lord, we praise you today. Lord, it's good to be saved. Thank you for giving your very best, Lord, for us and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your death, burial, and resurrection. And, and uh, Lord, that blood that you shed on the cross. Thank you. Thank you for loving us. Uh, Lord, if we were to sit down and count our blessings, the list uh, would be fill a page. And so... We praise you. We ask that, uh, Lord, you would undertake in this hour, capture our attentions, uh, have mercy upon us. Uh, Lord, uh, touch us. Uh, Lord, speak to us that we can find some help, uh, Lord, in this dark time. And, uh, Lord, that we could be encouraged, Lord, through your promises. I pray for your people that, God, you'd bless them and help them now. And speak to us. Feed us, please, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in verse number 24, when it comes to these promises, uh, look at something that Solomon does. Solomon says to God, he says, uh, talking about God, who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, thou spakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as this day. Uh, you know what Solomon did there? Solomon says, God, you have kept your promises. And that's a good thing for you and I to remember. It's a good thing for you and I to remember that God in our past has fulfilled the promises and answered the prayers that you have lifted up to him. Oftentimes in the Christian life, you can pray, you can pray. It's like Joseph's life. How can you, Joseph's life is unimaginable to think the amount of time that went on in Joseph's life and that it started hopeless and ended in hope. And sometimes in the Christian life, that, that's how it is. But when it comes to God's promises, uh, as Solomon did, uh, you, have to re, uh, uh, you have to remember and, 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 and tell God, God, you have kept your promises. You've been faithful. And then in verse number 25, Solomon goes on to say, Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him. You know something else in the Christian life that you have to do? And see, it's a personal thing. That's why we say we don't have a, relate, we don't have a religion with God. We have a relationship Amen. with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and you have to remind God, God, these are your promises. God, these are your promises. Lord, you, you, you've, you've come through on your promises up to this point. Our temple's built. We're in the land. You've, you've, you, have, you have done exactly what you've said to do. God's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said it, shall he not do it? Hath he not said it, shall he not make it good? Yeah, God is God. God can do those things. And Solomon said, God, you've done them, but listen, we got a lot to do here, and there's a lot of enemies on our borders, and there's a lot that's going to be coming down the road in our lives. God, I have to remind you, would you please keep the promises that you've promised? 
And you know what? Listen, practically speaking, you and I, uh, we have to do that as, as Christians in our life. Christians need to know what the promises of God are as found in the scriptures and remember how God has kept them and verified them. Look at verse number 26. And now, o, and now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified. Hold God's feet to the fire with his promises. He's God. His feet are already brandished. When John saw him, he was, he was like brass that's already shining and his feet were in the fire. You're, you're not going to hurt God by saying, Lord, you promised. Lord, you promised. Lord, listen, uh, this here and that there. And I, but our problem is we want it like right now. And sometimes God does it right now. And you and I have those testimonies in our life where God does the miraculous right now. We do. You can't argue with that. But in the same respect... When you're asking God to fulfill promises and these burdens are burdening you, or these needs are, are getting on you, sometimes it takes time for those promises to be worked out. Sometimes it's a day. Sometimes it's a week. But don't you know, you can't argue with me, that when that thing comes to pass and you think it's coming this way, and all of a sudden you see it back there and you go, wow, Amen. that captured my attention. That made God real. And in that whole scenario of this promised situation, you know what it's caused you to do? Not focus on the problem, but focus on the promise and the promise giver. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say promise keeper, but I don't know. He does keep his promises, amen? And as Christians, you and I need to do that, and he knows that. If he fixed everything right on time, virtually we would think we didn't need him and we could do it ourselves. Like a vending machine God, but God's not like that. He's not like that. That's how he gets glory. Look how long it took for the children of Israel, uh, getting ahead of myself, to be uh, formed of Abraham and then to uh, uh, be made a nation and then to go down into Egypt and then God said, I'm going to deliver you from Egypt. And Abraham, I'm going to give you a, uh, I'm going to make a people out of you. And I'm going to give you a land of promise and all this. Stuff. Look at the amount of time it took for that promise to come to fruition. And again, I love it. I love it when you can't argue with me. Because NBC, ABC, and CNN, and Fox, you know what they're all reporting on today? A fight going on in Israel. Yeah. <laughs> you can prove it in a court of law. You know what that is? That, that, just, that just garners me. That just bolsters my faith to know that I've not followed some cunningly devised fable and that this book really is true. And God is faithful with his promises. If God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now you say, let's go in the positive light. Yeah, but let's be balanced. There's also some negative light there too. I mean, there is this law of sowing and reaping. And that doesn't have to be a negative thing. <laughs> as you and I, you know, just because we're wicked as all get out, when someone says there's a law of sowing and reaping in the Christian life, there's a law of sowing and reaping, we want to shrink away and go, Aah. that'll be on the tape, won't it? Oh, no, it doesn't have to be. A farmer that goes out and sows soybeans or sows corn doesn't expect uh, for weeds to grow up and be a nightmare. If you sow weeds into your life, then weeds are what you're going to get. What do you want? Yeah. Listen, listen. The reason why I did the things in my life that were worldly is because those things promised joy to me. And they promised pleasure to me. They promised happiness to me. And you know what they, they, they uh, rendered unto me? Darkness. Tears. I couldn't trust nobody. The law of sowing and reaping, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Right. It can be a great thing. Right. So, I mean, listen. You were sowed, you were reaped, and here you are today. I don't know. But, um, and uh, so, so that's some things, uh, and we'll come back to that passage at the end of the message, but just promises. Hey, Solomon said, Lord, you've done it, but Solomon said, Lord... Would you please come through on these? As Christians, 
okay? If you've got money in the bank, you know that you can draw on it, correct? Okay, now listen, I'm just asking the question. If God has some spiritual promises that are sitting there waiting for you, and that you can get the benefit out of, well, are you withdrawing from them? Or are you fretting about paying the bill? Oh, I'm fretting about paying the bill because I don't know the promises. Well, maybe God allowed that situation into your life so that you would learn the promise, so that you'd, you would learn the four-digit code to check in to heaven and then make a withdrawal. And in so doing, what happens? Oh, this problem, oh, this problem, this giant's huge, this mountain is large, blah, blah, blah. But in so doing, as you took the withdrawal, God became real to you. So many testimonies in here. How you've gone through problems, gone through some serious problems, man. Gone through some stuff that says, whoop, his ticket's punched. He's out of here. And then people prayed. Then people hoped. Then those individuals sought counsel from God and the Holy Ghost of God led them. And you know where they're at today? They're with us. And they're a great testimony. And they're not how they used to be when they were in that problem. So uh, that's what Solomon did there. Now, talking about promises, look at uh, 2 Peter. Here's a, great, here's a great chapter, a great uh, verse. 2 Peter. You hear what I'm saying? Guys, you have to, we have to know the promises of the Word of God. Amen. The Bible is not a religious book. It's a legal binding document from your Creator to you. It's your birth certificate. And the, the, the more um, that you have on your insides through a daily basis, as Brother Mike talked about, when that messenger of Satan is sent unto you to buffet you, and you're dealt with mentally, and you're dealt with spiritually, and uh, it causes you to cringe, it causes you to want to stop. You have to meet that messenger with the promises of God. That's the extinguisher. That's the buffeter. What else do you have? When them thoughts come in and they want to crush you and all this, that, and the other, what do you have? Do you have you? Do you have your mindset? I'm going to take care of it this way. I'm going to take care of it that way. Well, that's good. Then why is it still coming back to haunt you and make you want to stay in bed? Why is it still coming back uh, a, a daily where the place you have to take some pills, you have to take some drugs in order to take the pain away out of your head. That is society's answer to anxiety today. Do you know that? Drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs to do something to your blood system, to do something to your psyche, to numb you to that thing that's gnawing on you. And I'm not saying that that's not needed sometimes. Don't get me wrong. I am not saying that. But when it comes to the Christian life, you're a blood-bought uh, sinner. There's also the promises in the Word of God to buffet that and to give you hope. Yeah. Yeah. And to give you comfort. And to know that He said, I, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And to know that I will supply all your needs. And to know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the call the corner of the purpose. Listen, there's Christians that have suffered in the past, and their, their suffering makes no sense. Totally out of my notes. When Mary took the, the ointment, a pound of ointment, very precious, that could have been sold for a whole lot of money and given to the poor. And you know what she did with that? She willingly did with that because she loved Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ made such a, a, a change in her life. She took one of the most precious things that she had, you women, you mess with a woman's hair. You're going to have a fight on your hands, amen? Don't mess with a woman's hair. Most precious thing she had, that's her covering. In the midst of all the doctors and the lawyers and everybody that was in that house, fair, or, uh, uh, all the people that were in that house, she got down and she wasted something that was very precious to her, that ointment, with something that was very precious to her. Yeah, you know, Christians, in this life, you're going to ask yourself, 
why this waste? What a waste. Mad that, I mean, that ointment, that ointment, again, <laughs> it could have done a lot. It, it could have been balm for, for burns. It, I, it, it could have taken poison ivy away. <laughs> It could have made the house smell good because the Bible says the aroma was in the whole house. So moms and dads, once in a while, you're asking yourself about your kids that you're raised in a Christian home. Lord, why this waste? Sicknesses will come in to people that uh, possibly don't deserve them. And you ask yourself and you ask God, why this waste? But yet, you know, the real answer to that scenario is... Maybe you don't understand it right here, what's going on. But I guarantee you, he understands what's going on. And I guarantee you, everybody in the room, as that waste is being wasted, is being affected by that waste as you're going through it. And Jesus Christ is glorified by that waste. So, um, so look with me, if you will, in, uh, uh, first, in, in 2 Peter chapter number 1, talking about promises. Uh, so, uh, it says there in verse number one, Simon Peter, Second Peter, chapter number one, verse one, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, don't lose me now. <laughs> we just talked about everything that an NFL player wants. We just talked about any, what I just read there in verse number three, what every Hollywood person wants, what every billionaire wants, and the list goes on and on and on of the gods that are held up in front of you and me. Every person that has had, had their name written in the sidewalk over in, where is that, in... Uh, uh, where is that? Where do they write them names at? Over in Hollywood or whatever, or over in California? You know what they've wanted? You know what they've experienced? Look at verse number three. Power. Divine power. A power that made them feel as if they were gods. To the place where a lady could, uh, what would you say? Say, I'm going to throw my weight behind this woman for presidency. And 300, 400, 500,000 followers uh, could be persuaded that way. You know what that is? That's power. That's divine power. But it ain't coming from the right source. <laughs> but that power is available for you and I, as I'm trying to, to say on a daily basis and minister to you of things sometimes that I go through on a daily basis. That power is available for you and I. And it says, according as his divine power hath given us to all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Well, that's, that's, that's right where I'm making my nest <laughs> and trying not to lay an egg, amen? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The divine nature allows you to walk on water. The divine nature allows you to feed the multitudes. Yes. The divine nature allows you to say, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. This is a very, very stressful situation right now and what you're asking me to do. And I really don't want to do this. The divine nature says, but not my will, thine be done. Amen. Three times. You want to talk about a stressful situation? You want to talk about uh, uh, someone that is being crushed? Not physically. Jesus Christ was talking about anxiety. Jesus Christ was being crushed spiritually. And he was given the decision, I can do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to follow through with this thing, but the divine nature, because he was able to trust the promises of his father, and he was able to trust his father, and he was able to see the, the goal of what was going to happen, him becoming sin. Uh, he was able to say, as I mentioned, which that's where we're at, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah. 
wow, that's amazing. I've never, now I've been in some crushing situations, but I've never been in a crushing situation like that. And I learned from Jesus Christ that he had to trust his father in the words and the testimony of his father. When he said, not my will, but thine be done. Um, and so, in verse number four there, Peter says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And so, the, excuse me, those, uh, those promises are given. Now, think personally, just between you and God, by faith, you and God, by faith. The reason why you have that Bible in your lap is because God gave it to you. Listen, the reason why you have this church is because God gave it to you. The reason why you have a Christian wife or a Christian husband is because God gave them to you. The reason why you have a Christian mom and dad, like it or not, is because God gave them to you. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. I could go a little further. The reason why you have a roof over your head, the reason why you have health in your body, the reason why you have uh, work, the list goes, the reason why you have the United States of America today. Amen. It wasn't our armed forces, although they sure did help and they protect us. I'm not saying that. Thank God for them. God takes his hand a blessing off this place. A loaf of bread will become $12, a day, uh, 12, $12 a loaf. God lifts his hand off of this wretched, miserable country that wants to do nothing but deny him and, 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 and kill the very thing that makes us a country. Hey, it ain't. Hey, listen, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You might be the reason why he hasn't brought judgment to this country yet. But he has given us all these things. Given them to us. Uh, and I'm reminded that when he did that to the children of Israel, when he did that to the children of Israel, that blessing became a curse. But um, so um, these promises are given. One person had to think of the other to give them. Now, let me ask you something. Christian, what promises do you have in your heart? What promises do you have in your mind that you pull up when you wake up? When the stress is there and you're not even personally thinking about it, but three o'clock rolls around and you can't, you can't sleep, what do you have? I'll fix it, but yet you lay there for two hours. Those promises were given and someone had to think of you to give them. Uh, listen, those promises were given. It cost one person something in order for you to have those promises. Peter said that they're, they're, uh, they're precious promises. You ever re remember receiving a gift? Or you ever remember meeting that bride-to-be? Or possibly that husband-to-be? I would say the bride. <laughs> but how precious she was? It, had to, it cost someone something in order to give. Uh, the person given uh, something has to receive it. Amen. Now, just very briefly, I'd like to remind you, can you imagine what it looked like on Mount Sinai when the children of Israel received the uh, covenant of God, received the law from God, received the principles of God, uh, uh, received the promises of God? What a grand sight. Well, they were afraid and they said, we can't go up there. And God said, all right, Moses, you come on up. But what did those promises do when Moses was with God for so long up in that mount? He came down with the promises. They looked on him and the promises changed his countenance. What a fearful thing to go up into that mountain that's on fire and to come back and your face is shining so bright. They say, Moses, we can't even look at you. Put a veil on. That's a grand thing to think. The promises were given. I think about Jesus Christ when he was on this earth. And uh, when he's on the mount there and with the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he was speaking his words and he was uh, giving those promises out. And you are the light of the world and, and all the things that he was saying there. Um, and how people used to hang on Jesus Christ's words as he gave those promises. You know what it caused people to do? It caused people the hunger for God. It caused people the hunger for Jesus Christ. They wanted to be around him. 
When Jesus Christ, when the Lord gave his apostles, he picked those apostles and he started laying out to them truth and laying out to them parables and he started to give them the words of God. You know what they did? They followed him. The promises of God caused those grown men, which were sacrificing a lot because they had families and they had businesses. Put yourself in their shoes. We forget about that. They weren't superheroes. They were just common Joes. Amen. Great people. Fishermen. <laughs> but his words caused them to follow. They were given. Um, and, and the book goes on, and the list goes on. The, epistle, the epistles of Paul, the promises that we have, were written to us and given to us from a jail cell. Or even the book of Revelation, when John was on the Isle of Patmos suffering, and we know what's going to happen in the future. What's all that? Those are promises. Those are things that haven't happened yet, but they're going to happen. You know what it's kind of like? It's kind of like back in the Old Testament. You remember when the children of Israel... Uh, came, they were in the, the uh, wilderness of sin for 40 years and they couldn't provide for themselves for the most part when it came to eating and, and the sustenance for their, their belly. And you know what God did? How, how easy is that? God dropped down that manna. Angel food. Manna. Miraculous stuff sent from heaven. Miraculous stuff given to the children of Israel in order to sustain them and to feed them and keep them going for 40 years. One thing I know about that, no other person got that than God's people. The other people, the people on the outside, they weren't getting manna from heaven. It was special. It was the things that kept them going while they were wandering through that wilderness of sin. But I'd have to remind you, and what I'm saying is those promises are given. What did the, listen, now this falls back on you and me. What did the children of Israel have to do in order to make flapjacks and in order to make crepes and uh, in order to make angel food and uh, in order to make uh, manna steak, medium rare, rare? How would you have it? What did they have to do? They had to go out and gather it, didn't they? Boy, that's where the responsibility lies on you and us. God, what are you going to do for me today? God, what are you going to do for me today? God, what are you going to do for me today? Well, wait a minute. Hold on, Jim. What have I done for you? <laughs> the list is endless. See the responsibility that's back on you and me? Right. Yeah. And so then look, like I said Wednesday night, man, when you work, you get a paycheck for your work. That's physical. Then you have the spiritual side of things. And it's our responsibility with them promises to harvest those promises and to have them in our garner, to have them in our head, to have them in our heart so that they can step forward and they can buffer uh, so they, they can extinguish some of those, those fears. I'll move on to say, if, uh, the next thing I like to say that those promises are given. I'd like to ask you, in your heart and mind, what promises are you leaning on? What do you use on a daily basis? Your, your situation could change like that. Amen. Oh, right there, that's a pretty busy, God forbid, that's a busy intersection out there. Please be careful when you leave this place now that I'm saying that. Amen. I'm saying your situation could change in the blink of an eye. Amen. I just want to ask you, if God's given you some promises to help you in life, and the frustrations that you have, what are you using for those helps? Next thing I'd like to say about God's promises, they're great. I don't know, I, you know, there's no prize, but uh, uh, they, they, I don't know if they have the cereal anymore or not. But there used to be a figure out there, he was called Tony the Tiger, right? <laughs> Anybody remember that? And, uh, and so uh, I had to look it up because I didn't remember myself. Uh, Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. And in the commercial, Tony the Tiger would go, they're great. <laughs> yeah. Well, God's promises are great. Look at Psalms 105. Psalms are a great place to find some comfort when you are dealing with anxieties. Because they were written as a song. And you remember that when Saul was all messed up mentally and spiritually, what calmed him down? Someone that played a song. 
And Psalms are a song. And if you're going through things, you have anxieties or all this, that, and the other. Psalms have a way of tempering. Psalms, somehow God, because there's so many angles, God speaks to you from the Psalms. And uh, you say, how do you know? Well, because I've had, I've had to visit the Psalms a little bit. Amen? You got white hair. I got white hair. You know, <laughs> it comes from trials and tribulations once in a while. Amen? But Psalms 105, I was going to read the whole chapter. Um, I'll just read uh, uh, the first five verses. It talks about Israel and how uh, God was faithful to Israel and, and, um, and what God did with Israel. Uh, Psalms 105, verse 1, I'll give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known, known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face every, uh, evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. But in verse 5 it says, remember his marvelous works. Look at them. You go all through that. You remember the history of Israel and coming in the promised land. But look at verse number 42. What I'm trying to say right now is God's promises are great. The psalmist says, for he remembered his promise and Abraham his servant. God started with one man and made a nation out of one man. You say, how does that affect me today? God started with one man made a nation out of one man, brought the Messiah through one man, brought the people of the Messiah through one man, gave us a book out of that one man, and here you and I are today as Americans. And your currency says, in God we trust. You know what that is? Because God remembering his promises and starting things with one man, he told Abraham, he talked to Abraham in a dream, I'm gonna make of you a great nation, God spoke that, God came through on that, and here you and I are today. You say, how does that affect me? What are the chances of you being saved and going to heaven and escaping hell if you lived in Istanbul today? Very slim. What are the percentages as compared to living in America? What are the percentages of you being saved on your way to heaven if you lived in Uganda today? But you know what? Because God was faithful to one man and starting a nation with one man and giving one man a land and then giving a, a book through those people here you and I are today. That's how it affects us, yes. right? As I told the guy the other day, it's, it's not a snake oil salesman type thing. I don't have a backwards collar on. Pastor, don't wear one either where we're trying to sell you for this, that, and the other. It's just some common sense things that touches us on a daily basis that we can say, oh, that is true. That does affect me. Promises of God. They're great. Uh, and as I just said, God made a verbal covenant and all that stuff. Uh, and, and, uh, and to think about that in the past of where we are, but in the same respect, through the pages of this Old Testament, God also said, I'm going to send a, a Savior. I'm going to send a ruler. I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send a prophet. I'm going to send a priest. And you know what happened? The promises came to pass. Amen. And you know what that is? Let me hear it. That's great. <laughs> you say, how does that influence me? Save me from sin. Brought me up out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And that's just here on this earth. Wait till I pass from death to life. Yes. Wait, till, uh, wait till this body is lied horizontal and I transition up into the heavenlies. Yeah. Amen. That's really going to be great. Why? Because God kept his promises. Um, and um, look, if you will, uh, with me in Romans uh, chapter number 15. A man said one time, God settles it, I believe it, and that's, uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I've said this before, it doesn't matter if I believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. Amen. Romans chapter 15. God's promises were given, and God's promises are great. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 8. 
talking about the, Jesus Christ. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circus, uh, circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ confirmed those promises. And, and he's not stopped just because he rose from the dead. Um, and that's a great thing. And then lastly, I'd like to say this. Uh, back in 2 Peter uh, chapter uh, number 1, uh, those promises are given. Uh, those promises are great. And the last thing that I'd like to say is those promises, the promises of God are precious. Amen. The promises of God are precious. Amen. Um, you know, you got uh, stocks and bonds and they're worth so much and maybe you do have some money in the bank. Maybe you do have some money in the piggy bank. But you know what that equivocates to in your heart and mind? Some, something that you can, as I mentioned before, something that you can draw on, something that gives you some comfort, something that you know if something happens and, and you need to go out and buy something. You know, like Dave Ramsey said, I don't know, whatever, you know, you need to have that $100 or $1,000 emergency fund or whatever, you know. That's true. But so are God's promises. Amen. They're, greater. they're precious. Uh, they're precious. They're valuable. They have high cost. And they're not to be uh, wasted. They're very rare. And you know what? Um, they're things that are precious. Uh, you, what's, what's precious to you? Well, my wife. Amen. Praise the Lord. My wife is very precious to me. Uh, you know, my kids are precious to me. Uh, uh, you know, there's precious stones. There's precious metals. Um, babies are precious. You know, you see that baby? Little thing, we just had a baby, little Levi, Anna had a baby, my daughter had a baby. Man, Audra sent me a picture, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to go see the baby. It's like, wow, just precious, sinless, just holy, just little cherub, just want to eat them up, you know, just eat them. <laughs> Babies are precious. Um, but it's an amazing thing, God's promises are precious. But would you agree with me, things are only precious in the eye of the beholder, as for what precious can be. You say, what do you mean? If you're in the desert <laughs> and you ain't got nothing to drink, how precious is a bar of gold? <laughs> it's, worthless. it's worthless. If you're in a gunfight or you're in a knife fight, what's a glass of water or a loaf of bread going to do for you? Not that I'd like to see in any of those things, amen. <laughs> Rather not see in a knife fight or a gun fight. If that's the case, call McFadden, amen? <laughs> he helped you out. Bring the Calvary with him from Texas. That's for you, Mike. Hey, you need to have the, the, the proper precious promises at the right time for the right occasion. Yes. And I said that about those promises on what you need, when you need, as I mentioned before. Uh, because you know what the world does with these promises? Look what the school system did with them. Yeah. Out. Get out. We don't want the promises in our society. But uh, to Christians, promises in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, I mentioned it Wednesday night too, repeating myself. You know, you know how you make a good cup of coffee? Yeah, you get the Krug thing. You put the cup in there. You put it down. I don't care. Or listen, you can steep it through the coffee pot or if you drink tea or... Or I, you say, I don't drink none of that. It's against my religion. All right, do you drink lemonade? <laughs> Whatever. You know, at the end of the day, something has to be filtered through something else in order to come up with another uh, drink or another sustenance or another this, that, and the other. And you do it because you want to drink it and you want to enjoy it. That's how God's promises are in the Christian life. Um, you say, prove it. Well, what are God's promises? They're, they're given, they're great, they're precious, but just a list of them. <coughs> are you in heaven right now? We're seated with Christ in heavenly places, spiritually, I understand that, but we're not there yet. But yet the Bible says, if you'd call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved, you're saved. Amen. Amen. But yet, you know, I don't get the influence of heaven right now. Sometimes it kind of feels like I'm, you know, in purgatory or something. I don't know, I get it. But the promises of God, uh, when you call on the name of the Lord, He said He'd save you, yes. and you're saved. Right. Uh, he said that you'd be saved by grace through faith, and it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right. 
He said that um, you're kept by the power of God. You couldn't lose your salvation if you wanted to. Um, he said there that uh, you're eternally secure. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now that's what he said. Sometimes I don't feel eternally secure, but my feelings have nothing to do of what God said through his promises. Not a lick. He said that he would seal you with his Holy Spirit of, of promise and that he'd be a comforter to you and a guide to you and a teacher to you. As I mentioned before, he said all things that would work together for good. Now, these, these, these aren't said from a politician. These things are said by God. Amen. These things are said by God. And you know, he didn't just write them in the stars. He wrote them in a book where he committed himself unto the very things that he said. And the list goes on and on. Uh, you don't have to be a servant to sin. You can live a victorious Christian life. When you pray, God hears you and answers your prayers. Jesus Christ's blood cleanses from all sin. We understand we have the promise that God's word is inspired, it's infallible, it's holy, which is a King James Bible. We have the promise to know that one day we're going to get raptured out of here and possibly very soon. And we're looking forward to that. Those things are all precious. Those things are all stuff that, that the world has no idea of. But as God's children, as he manifested that through the children of Israel, that he was faithful to them when they weren't unfaithful, he was faithful to them when they were faithful, he got the job done and what he said would come to pass did come to pass. You know what that means to me? God's closer than you think. You know what that means to me? You're harder on yourself than God is on you. The Lord's going to rapture us by undertaker or uppertaker. It's a promise. We're going to leave this world and we're not going to go to hell when we die. We're going to go to heaven. Man said one time, God's promises are like the stars. The darker the night, the brighter they shine. Um, well, as I mentioned, look with me. I'll be done now. <laughs> Look with me in 1 Kings chapter number 8. I said that we'd go back there. Man said one time, God's promises are greater than our problems. I'll give you one more and then I'll read this. I like this. God's promises are like a, uh, like a lifeboat when it feels like your ship in life has gone down. But wait a minute. It gets a little closer to home. God's promises are like a life preserver when the lifeboat has seemed to spring a leak. You're not going to get taken down. You may feel like you're drowning once in a while. Any person that the Lord will ever use has, has gone out into the water and said, it feels like I'm drowning. But that life preserver has held them up. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Now, do you see the importances of God's promise? The devil comes with doubt. The devil comes with fear. The devil says, it's always going to be like this. There's no need to even try. And God says, no, I've written it for you. Just a little bit will go a long way to keep you afloat. Look at, uh, look at 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter number 8. And uh, verse 56. Solomon says this, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Amen. Well, <laughs> that is some testimony about God. Amen. 
Are you angry today? Are you confused today? Are you fearful today? The list goes on and on. Are there troubles up ahead? Are there troubles now? Are there anxieties of your tomorrows that are stealing the joy of your day? Talk to me about it. I'll talk to you. You want to talk? Yeah. How can I say something like this if I haven't experienced it? We all do. But I know in my life that when I claim the promises of God, and there's a lot of them. Man, you can buy a King James Bible promise book today that goes, well, what is the promise for this? It's A through Z. It's already listed out for you and I. <laughs> There's one person that wants to keep you from those promises, and it's the same person that buffets you on a daily basis. Yep. But there's one person that says, hold on to the life jacket. Put the life jacket on. It's going to keep you afloat. Amen. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. One man said, when God makes a promise, faith is the currency that buys it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, God's promises are given, God's promises are great, and God's promises are precious. If you were to think over your past week and things that have bothered you over the past year and things that you're thinking about in your future, I have just tried to persuade you and show you that God is in control and his promises will stand and they will work for you as they've worked in the past. And that you need to have them in your heart and mind and you need to go to the Lord with them and do business and remind him of those promises. And that those cares and those burdens and those fears you need to take to the Lord and then come together with his promises and walk away and find the victory as you have in the past. Lord, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for the promises that are in this book. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for being faithful to us. Thank you for the promises, Lord, that you've given us. Lord, we struggle down here. We have fears. We have anxieties. We have stuff that want to crush us. Lord, want to put our lights out. Lord, but you're faithful and your promises, Lord, are faithful. Lord, help us. Give us the grace. Give us the thirst. Give us the desire to cash in, Lord, on your promises that we might live the divine life, as was mentioned, a victorious Christian life. Help us, God, we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.